Today, we'll be talking with Tennessee Congressman Andy Ogles, whose vote last week for Speaker Kevin McCarthy became one of the most watched stories of the week in one of the biggest stories of the year. Now, this former mayor, businessman, and philanthropist, who's known for cutting taxes, reforming health care, and leading an international effort to end the scourge of human trafficking, is here in Washington, ready to make all of this count. From Ballard Studios, it's 13th and Park. The future doesn't belong to the same party. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. We will make America strong again. We will get through this together. I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Well, Congressman, welcome to the show. As you would think there would be two of us here in terms of co-hosts, my other host is Justin Safey, who is far afield in the wonderful state of Florida, which apparently is home to one of your favorite governors. Well, it is. You know, uh, I, I kind of picked up the nickname during COVID uh, in Tennessee as the Ron DeSantis of Tennessee. Uh, and it was because I refused to comply with any mandate. And, and you can really look at the data. You know, you have the tale of two states. You've got Florida, you've got New York. And his, you know, Ron DeSantis' leadership speaks for itself. And then when you look for who's going to carry that Republican mantle in the future, who are those future leaders, you have to include Governor Ron DeSantis on that list, if not at the top. Now, they're still calling you mayor. Is this something you have to get used to to be called congressman? You're looking like, who are they talking about? That, that's right. You know, so I was a county executive. And, you know, in Tennessee, that's like a mini governor of your, of your county. And so I, I've been Mayor Andy for the last four years, right? And, and you know, you, you read the school kids, you, the county commission meetings, or whatever it is, you're Mayor Andy. And, and now it's a uh, congressman. And I almost want to turn around and say, uh, well, where is he? Uh, and so then you realize, oh, oh wow, that's me. And it's an honor, you know, uh, even now as I, as I walk into the Capitol. I'm a bit of a nerd. I mean, I think you by default have to be a nerd to be an economist. But our founding fathers, it means something to me when I sit in that chamber and I see and the feel the history, know the history, know that you're making history. And I just hope every member, regardless of party, always remembers that. Well, Justin, I think it was a hell of a week last week. Take it away. <laughs> yeah, it sure was. And Congressman, you were right in the middle of it. It's great to have you as a guest on the show. The nation was captivated last week with something that hasn't happened in over 100 years. Certainly in all of our lifetimes, we've never witnessed what we witnessed with the election of the Speaker of the House. It was a, a civics lesson. And you were one of the Republicans who ultimately voted for Speaker McCarthy after a series of compromises were made and affirmed. So what was it like for you, freshman member of Congress, all of a sudden you're in this very uncharted territory in terms of 15 votes to elect a Speaker of the House, and what did you feel the outcome of it ultimately was for you? Yeah, you know, first I had the opportunity. My family came up with me and, and my kids were able to be in the chamber with me. So not only are we, one, doing the right thing and standing on principle, but you're making history. And my children, they should automatically get an A in civics, right? Like they're living <laughs> through history. Their images are plastered all over Fox and Newsmax and the Epic Times because we were right there, uh, you know, it, to, to all of the action. But for me, you do the right thing for the right reasons. And then you stand in the gap and you take the punches or the consequences. And that's what we did. And for a long time, as a rank and file member, you had the ability to offer an amendment. You had the opportunity, the time to actually read a, a bill. Mm. And that's what we were fighting for. You know, even McCarthy's statement says that for too long, the, the power was nested in the speaker's lobby with the speaker. And we got some of that back through this rules package. And and I always go back to John Quincy Adams, right? You know, he was a, he was a congressman. He was a senator. He was a minister, now we call them ambassadors, right, became president of the United States. And then what did he do? He returned to his favorite chamber. He became a congressman again because it was, it was the people's house. It was the chamber that argued and debated. And he says the most raucous chamber, but it was the one that he loved. And as I sit there, and what we are arguing and we are debating, what we're fighting for is the best outcome, mm -hmm. right? And that's a good thing for the American people. Look, I've got a small farm. I love meat. If you don't like meat, I'm sorry, but I love meat and, <laughs> and I love sausage, but I don't want to see how sausage is made. What the American people saw last week is the sausage being made. And you know what? The outcome was a good thing. 
Well, I'll tell you, it's very good for C-SPAN. Their ratings were off oh, the yeah, chart. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, your kids must be terribly patient because they were thinking, okay, we're good. We're going to go to this great ceremony in the, on the floor of the Congress. And suddenly it was four days later, right, before right. that was even entertained. Well, you obviously were right in the middle of the storm and what was happening. You were on media a lot last week. There was one clip in particular I saw on Fox Business I'd like to play for you, okay. which plays right into what you're talking about in terms of empowering individual members of Congress to do the job they were elected to do. Cue the tape. You know, over the years, over the last couple of decades, the, the ability for a regular rank and file member to do their job has been restricted. I mean, I, I always say it's akin to the rules of Monopoly or, or a red light, green light, that game that you would play as a kid, yeah. right? The rules can actually favor a player. The rules can actually determine an outcome. And what we've seen over the last decade is that the rules were predetermining outcomes. And with the rules package that we've put together that we fought for, uh, that is going to be transformative, making sure that the rules are even for the American people. Now, changing the rules to allow every member again to have an ability to make a difference. Does this fit in a way, a Congressman, with your campaign promise about more transparency? And will this feed into making Congress a much more effective instrument of the American people? Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about it for a moment. You know, now if you're going to offer an amendment to the bill, it has to be germane, meaning the amendment has to do with the, the context of the bill. You now have single issue requirements for legislation, meaning that your legislation has to be specific to the task at hand. And so we're moving forward and really, I think, in uncharted waters. Is it going to be perfect? No, but that's OK, because what we do is we learn from the process. We strive for better outcomes, and because we're working to and for the American people, that's a good thing. And my promises on the campaign was I was going to come up here and fight. But in order to be able to fulfill those promises of being a fighter, I had to have the ability to go after earmarks. I had to have the ability to make changes by way of amendment and having my voice heard. And by the way, this is bipartisan. A Republican can do it. A Democrat can do it or somewhere in the middle can do it. And I can tell you, you know, as the rules package was being released and members began to realize what we had fought for and what we had achieved, I had member after member after member come up to me and say, thank you for what you stood for. Wow. And you were talking with other members across the aisle. They must have been feeling somewhat the same, no? I don't know if they would ever admit to it, right? You know, uh, but you know, as we and, and look, we all know that Congress is partisan. And you know, what I tried to teach my children when they were on the floor is, look, take AOC for example. You know, I'm guessing there's not much that she and I agree on, right? Um, but you know, I went up to her and introduced myself. We had a very pleasant conversation. She later came over to me and to my two oldest children and had written them a handwritten note. And, and the lesson there is, look, she and I can disagree on everything but we can still be respectful, yeah, right? Yeah. We can treat each other with decency because sooner or later, there is going to be something that we're going to work on together. And when that day comes, I want her to know or any Democrat to know that my door is open. Way to go. That's the way it should be. And at the end of the day, I know it's a trite thing to say, but we're all on the same team. We're all Americans. Okay. So okay. it's okay to disagree, but it's nice to be able to have that respect and that, that decorum at that level of government. Well, one of the big issues that's coming up uh, at some point this year in 2023 is the issue of the debt ceiling. You are a student of economics and a fiscal conservative, and there are different views even amongst conservatives. Some conservatives think that the deficit is a big problem. Others don't view it that way as much, or they believe that the government should do what it can to stimulate the economy through tax cuts. What's your view on the debt ceiling and how the Congress should approach it? Yeah, you know, so kind of econ 101, you know, and I'll, I'll oversimplify it. You know, when you have a government that's putting money into the economy, more money than the economy can naturally produce on its own in that given moment, the outcome of that is some sort of inflationary pressure, right? And so what's happened over COVID, during COVID and post-COVID is the trillions and trillions of dollars that have been put into our economy, there's no way that our economy could have generated those numbers of dollars. So to have an inflationary period that drives us towards a recession is logical. It's econ 101. And so what we've got to stop doing is all of the monies that we're putting into the economy, which to your point about the debt ceiling is if we can hold the line on spending and perhaps in there with some strategic cuts, we're going to grow our way out of this, right? Uh, but it's just going to take time. We didn't get here overnight. I, for one, would like to 
not raise the debt ceiling. I, for one, would like to purge the wokeness that is eating away at our budgets in the military and any other agency across the departments. And, and so we owe it to the American people to trim before we do any raising or any additional spending. Can you also comment on the role of the Federal Reserve and the inflationary pressure that we have and whether you think they're now doing the right thing by raising interest rates? Look, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? Uh, it is my opinion that they waited too long to react to the current situation at hand. That required them to not only react, but almost overreact. And I'm to the point now, I think what they should do is hold rates where they are, let the markets settle themselves out. Now, that also presumes Congress is going to stop the spending spree, right? And then let the free market do what it's going to do. We are going to get our way out of this. It may be bumpy along the way. But every time Congress spends money it doesn't have, we are hurting the American people and we're holding this economy back. Do you think it could be that the Federal Reserve will be looking very closely at what Congress does or doesn't do on spending as maybe a cue as to what they will or will not do? I would hope so. I hope they're taking a dynamic approach to it. You know, one of the reasons why I, you know, I wanted to be on financial services is to be a part of the Fed, the, the financial, the banking industry, insurance, et cetera, so that there is more accountability and oversight there. Let me switch gears for a second. You, for years, were the chief operating officer for Abolition International, whose mission is to end human trafficking, one of the most important, I think, pursuits of any out there in the world. How did that experience maybe change you and deepen you in terms of the things that you felt your life should be dedicated to in making life better, not just for people who are victims of human trafficking, but across the board? Yeah, well, for starters, I started turning gray during that period of time, you know, and I joke about it, but it's true. You know, so, you know, my midlife crisis was uh, law enforcement. So I was an entrepreneur and I come from a family of military, fire and police. And uh, so I went to the law enforcement lane. I was a reserve deputy for a period of time. From there, I went into the international sex crimes and ran global operations. And our niche was child trafficking because... You know, when you're working overseas and with uh, various states and their laws, there, there's almost a universal delineation between prostitution and a child who's being forced into prostitution. So it, it's a, it's a you're staying out of the gray areas, right? And by impacting child trafficking, you're also impacting human trafficking, right? So we found a, a unique niche there when trying to have impacts both on the rescue side, the restoration side, and then on the legal side. But when you look at the southern border, when you look at the fentanyl coming across, the drugs coming across, the guns coming across. We know that there's people on the terror watch list that have come across. And then, you know, 60% of all children that come across that border are sexually assaulted, male or female. 60% of the women that come across that border are sexually assaulted. And so what we've got to do, you can pick a lane. Maybe it's the economic lane. Maybe it's the homeland security lane. Or maybe it's that you're a good person and you realize that there's a travesty taking place on our southern border. And we've got to secure our border, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, when you have kids in South Dakota, when you have inner city kids all across the country that are overdosing on fentanyl, every community is now a border community, right? And so we, we've hit the crisis point. We've hit a flashpoint where if we don't do something, this is our fault. We know there's a problem. And every day that we don't act, it's on us. It's on me as a congressman, and it's on you as a civilian for not demanding it. And so we must move forward. This is a bipartisan issue. And anybody that's going to stand aside and let a child be raped, shame on you. Amen. Congressman, I'm curious. Obviously, the border is a big issue, and that that needs to be addressed. And I'm sure the appropriate committees in the House will take a look at that, and hopefully they'll take action on that. But other than the border, what is something that the U.S. government should be doing differently? in order to stop and end human trafficking? Well, you know, so anytime you're looking at, again, let's go back to COVID for a moment, and you think about the supply chain disruptions, right? And I hate to speak of trafficking in those terms, but the people that are doing this horrible crime, that's the way they view it. It is simply a supply chain. These men and women, these children are nothing more than a commodity. Mm -hmm. And any trafficker, whether they're moving drugs, guns, or children, they're moving all of the above, right? It's all about supply chain. And so part of the solution is to disrupt the supply chain. What is the quickest way we can disrupt the supply chain of fentanyl, cocaine, children, forced labor coming into this country? You shut down the border. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room to understand this. You don't have to be an economist to understand this. And look, my wife's grandmother came from Honduras. I'm for legal immigration. I have beautiful children because my wife is from Honduras. 
So don't think that I don't appreciate immigration, but we need a process by which people can come here, wait in line, but it's our country. We get to pick who comes in and who gets to come in may change over the seasons because it's our country. And by the way, I can go to the Middle East and I can work. I have to get a visa. I can never vote. If I break their laws, they're going to kick me out and I'll never be able to come back. That's how most of the rest of the world does immigration. And here we are sitting on our hands while our kids are being poisoned by fentanyl and children are being raped on the border. And we act like we don't know what the solution is. That offends me. And as someone who has worked in that space, who has seen the horrors of human trafficking, I am fed up and sick and tired of the excuses. And I don't care if you're a Republican and I don't care if you're a Democrat. Enough is enough. Let's go back into your past a little bit as a native of Tennessee, graduate of Franklin High. I think I got that right. Your family apparently goes back to statehood. That's a long way back. We've, so, we've been there a minute or two. <laughs> <laughs> How's the Tennessee experience imbued you with the mission you now are pursuing, not just in Congress, but in life in general? What is it about your background that gave you that drive to doing what you're doing today? Wow, that's a complex question. You know, I think part of it is just a family of patriots that have, uh, in a variety of ways, served their country. I think that was imparted to me back when the Boy Scouts were normal. I'm an Eagle Scout. And, and so I think that I've just always had a heart for service. And so when I ran for mayor, it was a pay cut to do so. But we had a budget that needed addressing. And I felt that my experience lent itself to it. Uh, I was able to do that. We were able to fix the budget. Uh, We were able to get better outcomes where I'm mayor or was mayor, I should say, fastest growing county in the state, rather one of the fastest growing in the country. And but also for economic development, you know, because I refused to comply with any of the mandates and I kept my community open because I was an advocate for the state of Tennessee to stay open. I had the honor, the privilege to negotiate over $5 billion in economic development for the state of Tennessee that landed in my community. Why? Because they knew we were a pro-business community. They knew that I would stay out of their business and I would fight for them to have the right to conduct themselves in the free market. What's the most memorable thing that's happened since you've uh, become a congressman? Well, you know, on a personal note, being able to share this with my family, my wife, our three children, three of the grandparents were able to come and be in the chamber and, and kind of witness history. And then also, I mean, I think People saw the friction in the chamber last week and assumed w- that we were divided. And except for just a few moments, flashpoints or so, that, that we were irreversibly angry at one another. But what I can tell you is one of the 20 who stood on principle, I was kind of expecting to be yelled at and attacked. <laughs> and that didn't happen. You know, uh, I had an exchange with Speaker McCarthy. And the context of that is I had been literally threatened by way of text from someone I had never met. And that evening I had reached out to Kevin and say, look, I don't know who this person is and, and who, who put them up to, to text me and how in the heck they got my personal cell phone number, but someone is doing this on your behalf and and it's not helpful. And we had, we talked back and forth for over an hour. It's a very productive conversation. And to his credit, the next day when he came up to me and was talking in a very animated, he, he was reassuring me and doing his best to convince me that, hey, I did not do that. I would not do that. And you need to know that as we move forward and we will move forward, we're going to work together. And so I commend the speaker for having that spirit of working together, seeing past. And he told us he's not giving up and and he didn't. And we were able to come up with a good rules package that I think the American people and every congressman should be pleased with. I'm proud of the work we did. And I'm looking forward to working with uh, Kevin McCarthy. And for that reason, right, didn't you have maybe a, a newfound respect for McCarthy because of the way he handled the cauldron of four days of the nation looking in on this non-ending speaker's election. Didn't that say something about him that you saw in him in just the moment you described? That's right. And and when I stood and when I, when I changed my vote with, with my colleagues as we moved, it's essentially a block. And I said that as an act of good faith, because we weren't done with the negotiations, we were almost there, but as an act of good faith to my colleagues, and to the process that we've been laboring at for these days, I vote for Kevin McCarthy. And so part of that is building trust, and trust goes both ways. Mm-hmm. Well, all I can tell you is that you are just beginning your journey here. You've had a long journey that brought you here. I think all of America is very excited about the prospects of anything new, especially a new Congress. You're very much central to that, only days in. That's right. Uh, in the middle of it, we wish you the best of luck, Congressman, and do what you've always pledged to do, which is the right thing. Yes, sir. Absolutely. 
Great seeing you. Thank you for having me. Wow. I mean, I remember watching, and I hate to admit this, it's like Adam got a life. I think I watched almost every minute of C-SPAN's coverage of the four days of the speaker's election. Is For me, it was compelling television. I think actually for a lot of Americans, Justin, and, and I remember Congressman Ogles at some point making remarks. I don't know if it was in an interview off the floor or it was on the floor. And he and many others among the 20 who initially were not in Speaker McCarthy's corner, he among them is one of the few I felt combined conscience with a constructive attitude, meaning he wanted to get things done, but he wanted the rules to enable and empower he and others to do that job. Right. And it's it's great to be able to talk to him and interview him and ask him about that experience because it really gets below the the narratives that were kind of put out there. And really, when you talk to him and you listen to what he had to say, it wasn't like he, I didn't get the impression that he was some damn the torpedoes, blow up the institution of the House of Representatives right. type of person. He was using his vote to try to change the rules of the House in a way that he felt would, and if you, I listened very closely to what he said, he felt that the rules were preordaining a certain substantive result. Yep. And he was hoping for rules that would allow for more debate, more empowerment of particular members. And look, that is a very different model than the Nancy Pelosi iron fist, strong (laughs) arm speaker model, powerful speaker model. And uh, these Republicans decided they didn't want that model. And the question I'm curious about, just I guess it's a little bit academic, but not really, is Mm -hmm. what lasting impact is it going to have on the speaker's power over the course of years? Do these reforms survive Speaker McCarthy, do they go over to Hakeem Jeffries when one day he becomes Speaker of the House of Representatives? Good point. That's an open question that I'll be watching closely. Well, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll get a verdict on that very quickly when it comes to the debt ceiling, because that's the first major issue, I think you could say, that's going to come before this Congress. It's going to be a very wide open debate, and it's not going to come in for a landing easily. And I don't know where that's going yet and what the, how the Speaker and others in leadership will play into that. But clearly, People like Congressman Ogles not only want to be a part of that conversation, they insist on being. And with this particular representative, with his stripes, you know, leading the Laffer Institute, Art Laffer, I remember the Laffer curve. I grew up with that. And his demonstrated experience and expertise on fiscal matters at a time when the country is spending a lot of money. I think this is, he kind of comes into the conversation, Justin, maybe at just the right time. I think so. And I do think, though, that the even though it was very messy to do the vote for speaker 15 times, I do think it provides a little bit of a template for how to resolve some other issues. Uh, At the end of the day, the Republican caucus ultimately came together. It wasn't pretty. It was messy. And I think the same thing will happen on the debt ceiling. There'll be some trial and error and they'll try to get the ball up the hill. But at some point they'll get there after some uh, horse trading, as we saw in this instance. I really was moved by his description of his time with that group that was going after human trafficking. And, and you know, some people approach things like that, and when they describe it, it sounds somewhat rhetorical. Sitting next to this congressman, I can tell you it was personal, and it was mission-driven, and that the mission isn't done. And I like the fact that, you know, this is an issue— that wasn't among the top three issues in the midterms, but should be a top issue on everyone's priority list in terms of our humanity. Yeah, when he uh, speaks about the border and speaks about human trafficking, talks about his family, his wife's heritage, Mm -hmm. he is going to be an extremely effective advocate for border policies that protect innocent human life and that stop the illegal trafficking of humans. So uh, he'll be he'll be a force to be reckoned with on that issue, no doubt. And I think a couple other observations I had was one, I thought it was interesting, his observation about his interactions with Representative Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Yes. Uh, and also, I thought that was really revealing. And I thought it was also interesting, the exchange he had with Speaker McCarthy, 
We really got some interesting insights there behind the scenes, behind the curtain insights into the personal relationships and engagement that these members, especially a freshman member, have. You got the feeling, too, that he would not have endorsed and voted for Speaker McCarthy ultimately if Speaker McCarthy, designated at that point, did not pass his own test of leadership. And this was a test for Andy Ogles. He wanted to see how Kevin McCarthy would respond to what he felt Andy Ogles felt was constructive advice. And I think he responded very well. I think this is lost in all the headlines talking about the kerfuffle and the chaos. It really was a test of leadership for Kevin McCarthy before he ever held the gavel. And I think for Congressman Ogles and others, he passed that test. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. And that was a really revealing interaction that he had with Speaker McCarthy. And it shows how much work and time and effort goes into persuading your colleagues to become Speaker of the House. Well, do you know also that he was the former, I think I'm saying this right, national political director or policy director for Newt Gingrich when Gingrich ran for president? Did you know that? I did not know that. Uh, you can see some of Newt Gingrich in Andy Ogles, can't you? Uh, absolutely. The impassioned uh, viewpoints and the way he uh, articulates his beliefs was very, very impassioned, I guess the, is the best word I can say it. So, yeah, it was great to have him as a guest and great way to start off the year with uh, with this podcast. Episode number 18 of 13th and Bark, first of the year. You're absolutely right. What a way to start. What a way for Washington to start. And hopefully, what a way for America to start as well. Justin, great to almost be with you since you're, you're a couple states away in the warm climes of Florida. Can't wait to do it again. See you next time. Don't miss future episodes by following us on Apple, Spotify, or other podcast platforms, or go to the YouTube channel where you can subscribe for free. 